right then. So let's kick off a new semester. Welcome everyone. This is uh, INF 4820, Algorithms for Artificial Intelligence and Natural Language Processing. I'm Stefan Oepen, one of the two teachers you will experience in this class this fall. The other one is Mohav Fares, and we'll be taking turns. Um, as a waiter might say in a restaurant in, say, California, we'll be taking good care of you. At least we'll try. Um, we'll typically be here in the lectures, both of us. We might even show up in the laboratory sessions. And we hope that we'll succeed in engaging you and interact with you, not just lecture to you. So, for example, at any point in time when you feel something is not clear or you can't hear me, can you hear me? then just speak up immediately, raise your hands, um, shout, interrupt us. Um, we would love for these sessions to be reasonably interactive. Um, the class is continues to grow. Um, so as of this morning, I think there were 85 registered um, for the past several years. Registration numbers have gone up by 20, 25% or so, I think, per year. Um, that has to tell us something about the, the subject matter artificial intelligence, natural language processing, we do feel there's a, a stream of fashion, a wind of fashion blowing our direction. Um, but it also tells us something about the general growth in student numbers at this department, so <laughs> um, that surely is, an, is a factor here too. But we're happy with that development. Um, probably some of you come here in the hope of um, continuing in the functional programming spirit, maybe have taken INF 2810. How many of you have taken INF 2810? Yeah, that's very good marketing, that class. Um, and that's a, a, a strong connection. We, we're happy for you to be here. Um, although this is not only, this is not even primarily, I would say, a programming class, but there will be a fair amount of programming. Um, and most of it in, uh, well, some of it, uh, a good part of it, nah, some of it, <laughs> a good part is actually overstating, in, in a functional perspective. Um, today's objective is to set things into perspective a little, to try and make sense of this uh, course title, to give you some expectation of what's coming up. I'll be taking the lecture today. And we're still in the process of putting more and more information on the course page, so um, follow there regularly. Um, um, we enrich it um, a lot these days, but we'll continue to post um, incrementally updates to the course page. So, um, why and what? Um, AI, artificial intelligence, NLP, natural language processing, processing, ML, machine learning, what are they? How do we interpret them? Common Lisp, the language of choice for us in this course, this semester. Some outline of the structure, topics in the lectures, learning goals and the associated reading and um, some practical information. That's today's agenda. Um, and I guess I can now say that we've had this class for six or seven years and I remember being fairly defensive about the course title. AI, Artificial Intelligence, Natural Language Processing. Um, AI, five years ago I would say was, or seven years ago, well five years ago, was not a, a, a term we used very proudly, not a word we expected to really appeal to the youth new student generations and um, any of you rec recognize this? So this is <laughs> you're betraying your age or maybe your your nerdiness but um, this is Hell 9000, um, a fictional character, computer that exercises very human-like behavior in this um, movie um, 2001, Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick, movie about as old as I myself, um, from the 19, late 1960s. And um, 
I think that, that, that still serves as a suitable icon of the vision of AI, even though uh, we're about to say the interpretation of AI actually evolves uh, from decade to decade. And um, it does so certainly in cycles. So um, from the 1950s till today, um, there were decades when AI was very much in fashion, like now, and very much not in fashion, something to not be proud of, like maybe 10 years ago. Um, and currently we can enjoy being on the, well, in, in an upward wave of this uh, cycle of, of hope. Um, there's a lot of media attention around artificial intelligence and um, some of that more recently, recently related to the dangers of artificial intelligence. So I have to warn you, we'll enter a dangerous territory here. Actually, I don't think we will, but um, <laughs> um, the name, the brand name, AI, the vision is today also associated with uh, uh, well a certain voice of caution and maybe even fear. So uh, no one less than Stephen Hawking in a uh, um, contributed opinion in the Independent about two years ago said it's um, would be a mistake to dismiss the notion of intelligent machines as, a mis as, uh, as science fiction, as we saw it in the Kubrick movie. Um, and um, making that mistake could potentially be our worst mistake in history. Um, the short-term impact of AI still depends on who controls it, um, but the long-term impact may depend on whether it actually can be controlled at all. So that's certainly an existential uh, risk that he's setting up here and um, another luminary in the tech world, Elon Musk of Tesla and SpaceX uh, in the same year actually said with AI we're summoning the daemon. So welcome to that exercise. Um, we'll do a tiny bit of that and it won't be dangerous to us at all and we hope to um, approach it in a manner that won't be dangerous to mankind. Um, except for today's lecture, we actually won't concern ourselves a lot with the ethics of AI, but we'll drop in pointers here and there for you to follow up um, if, if you will. Several people have joined um, this initiative. Um, uh, there's something called the Future of Life Institute and that actually lists AI um, in the company of biotechnology, nuclear technology, climate research. So the sort of big topics in the future of, of mankind. And there was a, uh, a year after the um, opinion piece by Hawking, there was a, an open letter issued by, by now signed by about 8,000 people, most of them leading voices in science and industry, like these people here, uh, Steve Hawking, Elon Musk, Peter Norwick, director of research at Google, Steve Russell, early AI pioneer, Steve Wozniak, co-founder of Apple. So there's a, uh, let's say, prominent group of people concerned with the um, the ethical implications of pursuing this vision, vision of intelligent machines. Let's um, look a little more at how one can interpret that vision. Um, before we do so, I just picked up a few screenshots. Um, AI is all around us these days, so it's certainly part, um, it's certainly perceived as part of our daily lives. In fact, I would agree, I think, that all of these examples I picked here are AI at work in our daily lives. So uh, not so long ago, a driver in his Tesla actually got killed in an accident where the autopilot failed to detect a, a roadblock, a truck that suddenly turned um, into the road, and the Tesla just crashed into the truck and underneath, and the driver was killed. Um, so the autopilot was... Um, well, not fast enough or not good enough to actually detect that obstacle that suddenly um, was put into the, the, the path of this car. Um, reportedly, the driver was watching a, a Harry Potter movie. Um, I, I wasn't able to 
uh, quickly discern whether that's actually true or not, but there are such reports. And I think the lesson clearly is that the autopilot, the self-driving cars technology is not quite there yet. That we should just sit back and, and let computers drive um, um, without our attention. Um, uh, less, uh, much less lethal. Um, this is at the, the Stanford Shopping Center, just next to Stanford University, one of the hotbeds of AI research in the US. And they have these intelligent security guards, robots. And one of them this summer knocked over uh, a toddler. And then there were follow up articles of the toddler got a, a bruise on his ankle. Um, <laughs> But I mean, the, the thing weighs uh, 300 pounds. So what is that? 140 kilos or so. You can you can see how that would be um, a potentially dangerous object to run over a toddler or even any one of us. And um, apparently there was some interaction. The the toddler trying to actually move away from the robot in a manner that wasn't part of the robot's understanding of how humans react to it and that caused this crash and it led to follow-up articles uh, reflecting on well the new reality that toddlers already need to learn when they <laughs> learn to walk and um, judge um, obstacles that um, they might encounter and on a on a more positive observation uh, big news uh, this spring uh, AlphaGo uh, uh, a computer playing the Go game, which is generally, I think, accepted as a lot more challenging than chess uh, because it has a much larger space of possible turns. Um, and for the first time this spring, a uh, computer actually beat uh, the world champion. Um, that may not be the right term, but um, uh, professional nine Dan, that's the highest uh, rating in human players, uh, Go player, in uh, four to one of five games, and that came. That was that was news. That was a remarkable breakthrough, and um, it was delivered by a company um, that's now a subsidiary of Google, a company called Deep Mind. Uh, funded uh, six years ago. So <laughs> IBM had this series of, of taking on grand challenge competitions. IBM built the first computer to be the chess world champion. Deep Blue, when was that? Maybe 10 years ago. Some of you may remember it. Um, um, we'll look at another grand challenge that IBM solved couple of years ago but so here uh, uh, a startup essentially um, uh, a new company that grew out of uh, an academic environment um, uh, just outside of London um, uh, grew out of associations to, to Cambridge University um, managed to to build this software system this piece of computer, um, hardware and, and software, that pulled off this, fe this feast, something that I think a couple of years ago most of us would have not expected to happen um, so soon or anytime soon. So leaves us with the question, what is AI? And for most of the semester, we won't concern ourselves too much with the history of AI or various competing interpretations. Um, we'll take a much more practical or pragmatic uh, perspective. We'll talk about specific problems that we want to solve. But to set the stage today, I'll use two, three slides to actually go through a little bit of, of AI history. And um, I think we can trace back the 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 notion, the vision to uh, this um, statement by Alan Turing, the pioneer of, of modern computing, of com computability, who said, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? Highly provocative at the time, 1950s. Um, still provocative, maybe, to many of us today. And not a question we will seek to answer in this class, but 
What we will make computers do, I personally would not quite consider thinking. Um, and at about the same time, uh, late 1950s or mid 1950s, there was the historic Dart Mouth Conference where AI researchers for the first time gathered, or researchers in mostly the emerging field of computer science, um, gathered and to discuss this idea of intelligent machines. And the term AI was actually coined by John McCarthy in connection to that, that conference. And some candidate definitions proposed at the time, the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. So science is the theory side of things, you might say. The engineering is the implementation side of things. And um, it, it's, it's couched certainly in a computer science tradition. Um, so machines here means computers. And it all hinges on this notion of intelligence. Uh, um, every aspect, McCarthy at the time conjectured, um, believed every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. That's quite a mouthful and it's not something I think we would um, necessarily uh, articulate today. So. This betrays a uh, strong, firm belief at the time in our human ability to well, understand our own intelligence, to actually <laughs> work out the mechanisms that are at play in human intelligence. Um, and that is essentially what nowadays is called cognitive science, um, sub-branch of, of psychology. And uh, for all I know, I'm not an expert in um, human, in, in cognitive science, for all I know, um, there are still many aspects of human intelligence that we do not fully understand and that we certainly cannot describe uh, in a manner, so precisely here, of course, means in a mathematical, in a formal manner, so that computers could actually operate over these descriptions. Um, and um, I'll briefly look at, at how paradigms in AI have evolved. And um, this, from today's point of view, I think would have to be considered a, an outdated and old-fashioned um, perspective approach to AI. And in all of this, uh, language, so our ability to communicate in a language like English or Norwegian or German, um, has always been in a central place. Um, that's a big part of human intelligence. And the connection is evident in the, so one of the things that Turing entertained as a, I think, entertaining idea at the time, the Turing test. Everyone knows what the Turing test is all about? Have a human interact with some entity behind a wall, let's say through sending messages, uh, WhatsApp, I guess, nowadays, um, and um, engage them in, in some kind of dialogue and at the end of that dialogue the human is unable to say whether they interacted with a machine or with another human. Um, and so that hinges um, in no small part on the ability to communicate in natural language. Of course it requires more than that but language is center piece here. So if we if we try to pick some of the milestones in AI development and chat bots uh, were there from, from the beginning. Eliza, some of you might know, uh, uh, a chat bot essentially that engages you in a therapy session. It's a behavioral therapist. Um, um, ma solving logic, mathematical problems. Um, reasoning in very simplified uh, worlds. So the blocks world is, is a robot um, uh, moving around various objects in a three-dimensional world. There are some cubes. Um, I think they're actually they're only cubes. Well, they may be balls. And they have different colors. And the goal is to produce a stack of things. And 
that requires some reasoning, moving things out of the way, the bottom most in the right position and so on. So that was an early um, AI accomplishment. It actually received commands, the, the, the goal, the objective, in human language at the time. Expert systems um, and game playing, of course, for example, the Deep Blue or more recently AlphaGo breakthroughs. And just looking at this um, selection of AI applications, I think we it's, it's, it's eminent that it's a moving target. Um, whatever requires intelligent decisions, some notion of intelligence, but seems out of reach technologically just now, but maybe within reach like five years from now. So something that we can hope to accomplish in our next project and has often been explored as um, sort of intermediate steps in the evolution of artificial intelligence. And so one could say, uh, argue that web search um, a couple of decades ago um, could have been considered AI, making sense of the vast collection of information um, distributed over the internet. And open domain machine translation, something that we actually worked on in our research group here like 10 years ago, um, um, is a commodity application nowadays. You may have used Google Translate or Bing Translate. Um, until around 2005, um, that was considered out of reach. Um, I think Google launched it in 2008 or so, so there certainly was a, a, a breakthrough at the time. And I remember being surprised, and I'm still astonished sometimes today when I run uh, Google Translate, including speech recognition from my cell phone. So there have been tremendous advancements in technologies that enable computers to interact with us in intelligent ways, which often means in our human language, in the recent 10 years. And that's, of course, no small part of the current AI hype. Um, yes? So we're screencasting here, so I'll actually try to repeat your question so that it goes on the recording. Um, so I think you're, so you observe that I put intelligent in quotes, but not artificial intelligence on this slide or on none of my slides so far. And you're asking, what's the reasoning behind that? Um, and what was the second part of your question? Um, is, it s is it actually disputed that whatever we could build in terms of intelligent machines would be artificial? So can there be, can there be natural intelligence that comes out of our work on artificial intelligence? Um, I think you're, you're headed towards deep philosophical questions here. Um, the first part is easy to answer. I put it in quotes because I don't want to spend too much time in trying to define what we mean by intelligent. Something that many of us will accept as intelligence. That's the interpretation of intelligence I'll propose for the purpose of this class. Um, not necessarily passing the Turing test, but doing something sensible with natural language, for example something that we accept is not trivial. Um, personally, so I mean, a, as we move towards the deep philosophical questions, and today is possibly the only time that we'll have an opportunity to discuss these in class, but we might still do in, in breaks or during the laboratories or online. Um, Um, no, personally, I, so a, any of these, so AlphaGo, uh, 
maybe the currently most impressive accomplishment of AI design, science, and engineering, all in one piece. And demonstrated to the public in this show-off game against uh, one of the world's best Go players. So if we, if we take that, it's still, to me, obviously an artifact. It's something that humans have built in the laboratories of the DeepMind Corporation. And we can understand to a certain degree what's inside and how, how it works. It's something we can study. Uh, and so um, that to me unambiguously is an artifact that is it's artificial. And furthermore, um, where it stands today, um, it's good at Go. Um, that artifact, that software system, um, is good at Go and nothing else. And the way DeepMind actually works is they currently focus on computer games and the computer games that they can um, um, sort of solve competitively are for the most part relatively old fashioned slow moving computer games. And the intelligence hence is still very specialized in these artifacts and um, I don't know why I would currently expect that um, we'll break out of that situation with current technologies and, and what is currently happening. Um, but of course there's the concern that as a matter of scale, I think that's the argument of Stephen Hawking, Musk et al, um, that open letter, um, that going through that development pattern, um, AI can evolve to a scale, essentially, and a role in our everyday lives. I was trying to sort of give you an awareness of this AI entering our everyday lives through these examples, where we need to think seriously about the implications for our everyday lives and for the development of the evolution of mankind. Um, not sure if so that's my attempt at answering that question. Allow me to move on. Um, I think I was just getting ready to say, um, to, to try and wrap up this entire setting the stage by saying, for our purposes, we'll consider AI a, a, a toolkit, a, a bag of tools, uh, methods, um, techniques for representation of non-trivial problems and problem solving, processing those representations. And we'll give you examples of these techniques and all of our examples will be applied to human language. Um, that's because we are both in the research group here in the department that is the, called the Language Technology Group. So Google Translate, Apple Siri, um, Web Search for that matter, all of these are language technologies. And um, hence we will focus on the sub field or that aspect, those aspects of AI that we know best, natural language processing. But often these are representative, the problems that we study and the methods specifically, the techniques are representative of a, a larger class of problems that you see um, in closely related variants in other sub-branches of artificial intelligence. So NLP, natural language processing, we propose to interpret as making computers quote understand. Again, I use the quotes to distance myself a little from uh, what does it mean to understand. Um, well, that means to maybe respond to human language instructions, let's say, in a manner that suggests that um, that something was actually successfully communicated in that message. Um, language technology, computational linguistics are nicknames, if you will, for natural language processing. Uh, like AI, um, 
if you will, computer science for that matter, a young and inter interdisciplinary field in that um, we're here in the computer science department, but um, to actually enable computers to make sense of human language, we also need some understanding of how human language works, of its structure, of, um, of what makes it a, a system for communication. And that's uh, uh, human language. The study of human language is, is linguistics. Um, but there are obvious connections to other um, disciplines here, the cognitive sciences I've mentioned already, more and more statistics, information theory, machine learning, I'll say a little more about machine learning. So in that sense, um, this class is primarily a computer science class, but we'll um, fill in, we'll make connections to, or we'll show you at least connections to several of these disciplines, notably statistics and machine learning. Um, just to give you some more tangible idea, um, you've all used language technologies. You've all been the users, the beneficiaries of natural language processing. For example, grammar checking or even spell checking, auto-completion when you type um, into your cell phone, um, suggesting the next word that might fit into the sentence that you're just composing. Um, all of these are applications of natural language processing. Machine translation, I've briefly mentioned. Um, question answering systems. So um, The other day we were trying to work something out that was really very difficult to Google. What was it? I don't recall. We were certain that the answer was available on the web, but it was the kind of thing where we would have liked to ask um, if I could only remember the question, a specific question. Um, what is the number of residents in Iceland who um, um, play soccer? That was not the question. <laughs> it was deeper than that. But uh, So something where it's, it's very clear how to ask for a specific piece of information in, in, a, in a sentence. But that was very difficult to translate into just a keyword search. And because um, asking the question requires that the keywords relate to each other in specific ways. So that's what, what characterizes a question, that it has some internal structure. Um, what can I help you with? So Siri, uh, Google Now, uh, what's the Microsoft version called? Cor Cortana? Um, are somewhere between QA systems and, and dialogue systems. So uh, a QA system would answer the question, do I have an appointment tomorrow afternoon? Um, a dialogue system goes a little further. It has some notion of where we stand in a conversation. So I don't just ask one question, receive one answer. I can then follow up. If not tomorrow, how about on Friday? Saturday, if it were. And then I would expect the dialogue system to be aware of the state of the conversation and us talking about appointments afternoon. So keeping track of the context of com communication. All of these translation um, QA and dialogue systems now standardly uh, involve speech recognition, also synthesis, so outputting um, speech. And they are beginning to involve intelligent information extraction. So um, I might pull from a uh, reviewing side of restaurants um, the average recommendation and the average price level, let's say. And then I could say, um, can you suggest a restaurant in the area that is not too expensive? serves decent Italian food. And Siri would say, I recommend Arte Pazza or Villa Paradiso or whatever. And that would require that there is this background um, uh, information and um, that 
preferably would not be hand coded. Google actually does a fair amount of hand coding of relevant background information and others do too. But a lot of that I could actually extract from existing content, often uh, in natural language form or semi-structured, as you will find on restaurant review sites, um, and make it available to the machine for access through natural language. Summarization is, in a sense, the, the um, um, I was going to say the inverse, but that's not quite correct. So, um, stock analysts, for example, um, they need to keep abreast of what happens in the corporate world. And uh, there are tons of documents published every month. Um, and ideally, they'd, they'd, they'd read all of them. Earnings reports, uh, merger and acquisition warnings, press releases, you name it. But uh, there's just too much for them to read. And so summarization is an application of natural language processing that tries to cook down a document, let's say, to a shorter version, a paragraph, that summarizes the main points to give us a first idea of whether or not this document is worth our time and worth reading in full. Uh, something very much in fashion lately, sentiment analysis, is trying to enable computers to work out the sentiment that we experience when we make a statement. For example, when Samsung launches a new cell phone, they follow very closely in user forums, Twitter, social media, um, and try to track live, in real time, the reception of that product. So they're interested in the user's sentiments. Some users will say, greatest phone ever. And Samsung will say, well, that's nice. But that's not the most helpful feedback to them, actually. Some users will say, crappy design. Others might say, poor reception when I hold it in my left hand. And that's really an alert, because that may develop, that may actually pinpoint a deficiency, a weakness of the product, and maybe something that Samsung can either try to manage, they can try to manage public perception of their product as perception evolves, um, or fix through updates or um, add-on products or whatever. So um, these are just some examples of applications that require some understanding of language, where information is communicated, is expressed in human language, and we want computers to process, to relate to that information um, in reflection, in what can I say that is not understanding, <laughs> based on an analysis of some of the structure of that information. Um, so that takes us back to the connection to AI. This is another recent breakthrough, recent as in 2011, I think. Yes, um, the IBM Watson system. We used to show the video a lot. We've stopped doing it. Have you seen it? It's cool. Uh, so this was IBM again, who said, um, we'll take on this, this US TV quiz show, Jeopardy, where people are given a cue, and they kind of need to reason backwards. So the cue is this two-word phrase means the power to take private property for public use. It's okay as long as there is just compensation, just as in fair. And then there are three... No, it's je yeah, Jeopardy is multiple. No, Jeopardy is not multiple choice. So what we're seeing here is the computer's internal shortlist of candidate answers. So the, the player is expected to say, uh, what is eminent domain? So that's the two-word phrase that this queue is, is looking for. And uh, eminent domain we might recognize currently because it's something that Donald Trump has apparently applied a couple of times in his business career. Um, and so that's the power to take private property for public use against some kind of compensation. And obviously this IBM Watson system, 
had to make sense of the question, or the, the cue as it were, it's not really a question. And then it had to reason backwards over a large database of common knowledge and somehow work out that what is described here is the concept of eminent domain. Maybe also confirm that eminent domain is two words. And here it has, so what we're seeing here is, is the uh, ranked list of, of, of answer candidates and um, eminent domain is the correct answer and it was by far ranked the uh, most likely answer here. And so in 2011 they set up a, uh, a public broadcasting again, of course, against the two long-time, all-time US Jeopardy champions. And the system just won with flying colors, took them down seemingly with no effort. And this was a, a, a very large computer, a supercomputer. Um, and there had been a team of hundreds, at least, I would say, of engineers, scientists who had worked on this system for about four or five years. And IBM took home this publicity prize, and since, they're trying to productize uh, this. So they're now, Jap uh, Watson has become a, a, a product name, and IBM is now selling Watson-based systems uh, for various, uh, for example, for health services or to the oil industry. I think I've even seen Watson for cooking uh, a year or so ago. But sort of the move from this public show of strength, beating two humans in this uh, quiz show, to a successful product has not been that smooth for IBM so far, as far as I can tell. But again, this is widely accepted, or this is clearly artificial intelligence, beating two humans on a on a quiz show like this and it it hinges in no small part on being able to make sense of natural language um, yeah I think I can get through these so what makes natural language processing an interesting problem what makes it difficult and um, and that is what we call ambiguity and ambiguity is the property of signals of expressions in natural language of being open to multiple interpretations. Um, and that happens at various levels of linguistic description or analysis. I'll show you a few examples. And you might wonder, so you've, I think, all observed that there's room for misinterpretation, misunderstanding. I say something and you believe what I said is actually not what I intended. Um, so you might wonder, well, why is natural language that way? Why is it ambiguous? Um, so, a classic example, I like to eat my sushi with chopsticks. And I was talking to a colleague who was trying to be funny and he said, chopsticks in your sushi, isn't that very crunchy? And he had jumped at the interpretation of would be the parallel of I eat sushi with tuna. So the with thing inside of the sushi. Whereas obviously I thought I had intended the interpretation of using the chopsticks as the tool in the eating. So that's ambiguity and you might ask, why do we have that in, in natural language? We don't have that in our programming languages. We don't want there to be uncertainty about what we mean by writing down a piece of Java code. Natural language is a language or a code, if you will, that we use for a much broader, much more complex um, domain of problems. And ambiguity actually makes it an efficient code. So if we had, if we were required to invent a unique word for every concept, for every entity we might want to mention in natural language, that would make the code unwieldy. Um, large to a, a, a size that would be not manageable. And so ambiguity actually allows us to use the same expression, single words or phrases or whole sentences, in different contexts and sometimes leaving part of the information underspecified. So in my I ate sushi with example, the with can be the instrument, 
the tool I use or it can be something, an ingredient. And what is underspecified is the exact nature of that, that relation. So there is some information that I actually don't make explicit. And again, that makes the code smaller, makes it more efficient. That works for us most of the time because we have access to background knowledge, um, mutual understanding of the situation. So I, I believe my colleague was trying to be funny. He was deliberately misunderstanding me. And we put to use all of this additional information on top of the linguistic signal, the, the piece of natural language that we actually exchange, to fill in the information that is left implicit and to work out among the possible interpretations the one that the speaker actually intended. At that, let's take a break here. Back in 15 minutes, 16 past the hour, and look at a few more examples. All right, welcome back. So let's continue with our introduction of what makes natural language processing an interesting problem. Hard problems are the interesting problems. And I've motivated ambiguity in natural language. It's a feature, it's not a bug. But to computers, it means disambiguation, picking among possible interpretations, is a central part of natural language processing by computers who don't have all of the background knowledge and the human reasoning that we don't fully understand at their disposal. And typically NLP problems thus will be search problems. So that is one uh, characterization of the types of problems we will be attacking in this class. Here are some examples. The Norwegian ret, what does it mean? My Norwegian is still limited after 15 years in the country means right or dish, or justice, or court, or straight, or law, or great. Um, and so some of these are what we call nouns, kind of the names of things. Others are adjectives. Something has the property of being correct or fair. I think it can also be used as a verb. Ret de op. Uh, so, these are ambiguous in meaning, obviously. Um, I mean, these are different interpretations of one word in Norwegian, and the ambiguity relates to meaning. But it also relates to what we call the part of speech, the syntactic category, noun versus adjective versus verb. And deciding whether something is a noun, an adjective, or a verb is one of the problems we'll actually address in this course. And what we need is context. So if we see red, <laughs> that's the, the code switching when I talk English to Norwegian is difficult. So if we see red in <laughs> in an English in in a Norwegian sentence while I talk English, and um, then from context we can typically tell whether it's a noun or an adjective, and which of these meanings, which of these interpretations is most likely um, intended. Uh, Strecken må være rett, straight, kunden har alltid rett, um, is always right, I guess. So that's this one, probably. Um, so this is one aspect of natural lang language ambiguity um, that gives us a search problem that we can resolve in context. And I've already invoked this notion of the most likely, and that notion is something we will translate into statistics. Um, other types of ambiguity in natural language. Um, the authorities jailed the protesters because they advocated revolution. Is that a... So, the question is, who are they? The color coding tells us. Um, this sentence makes sense with advocated revolution if I interpret they as referring to the protesters. Um, advocating rev res revolution would not be a reason for the authorities. So the authorities advocating revolution would not be a reason for jailing some protesters. But because they feared revolution, in this case, the they actually would be referring back to the authorities. So here a pronoun, one of these little critters in natural language, is 
ambiguous in what it refers to. This is referential ambiguity. Um, this one I have invoked already. This is structural, or as we will say, syntactic or grammatical ambiguity. I like eating. I like eating sushi with tuna. That's sushi with tuna. Or with chopsticks. That's eating with chopsticks. So the with actually can tell us something more about either the sushi, the object of the eating, or the act of eating itself. So that's something that we will explicate in terms of different structures. Um, also at the level of speech recognition that I said has, has made great advancements, um, there is ambiguity of course in translating from the speech signal to a string of words. Um, so let's talk about how to recognize speech. Which one of the two did you just hear me say? Sorry? The? The green one. Let's talk about how to recognize speech. <laughs> and what you don't know is in my youth, actually I used to live in uh, southern Denmark and there we had a, I mean there are these beautiful beaches and Norwegians like to come there and we thought that was unnecessary. So frequent topic at our gang meetings was how to wreck those nice southern Danish beaches. I mean this may have seemed implausible to you but every Friday evening when we got together with a box of beer, we said, let's talk about how to recognize beach tonight. <laughs> Made up maybe, but um, here we have a clear sense of one is plausible and the other is not, but I can change context and that at least helps to make the other one accessible, maybe even plausible as well. So all of these are ambiguities in natural language. And how does natural language processing approach these ambiguities? Again, a very brief, superficial look at the history of the field. Um, we'll say that traditionally there are two broad paradigms in NLP, just as they are in AI. Um, one often called the rationalist approach, based on formal rules, algebraic procedures, explicitly represented knowledge. Um, that is often manually encoded. So there's the knowledge engineering problem. I, humans need to sit down, as McCarthy suggested in the original quote, and not only understand every aspect of the problem solving, but also code it, describe it in formal terms. And that contrasts with what is often called the empiricist approach, and that is uh, seeking to automatically infer patterns from observable data. So if I were to look at, um, if, if I knew um, the correct underlying structure here, or if I knew how they resolves in different contexts in terms of a previous entity that has been mentioned, then I could hope to have a machine um, look at the different contexts and infer the patterns that favor one versus the other interpretation. So that's an empiricist approach. Um, and in history, the early days of NLP and AI were purely rule-based um, and well, were dominated. Um, there have always been empir empiricists around and were dominated by rule-based um, approaches, but in the late 1980s, certainly a turn of the, of the, the century, um, empirical systems were beginning to outperform rule-based ones um, and the first eye-opener was speech recognition. Um, that is something that began to actually become possible, doable, in an empiricist approach, learning from recorded speech signals and the associated transcripts. So for each speech signal, someone sat down and paired it with the corresponding string. You might say like a subtitle in a movie. Um, so um, oftentimes the, the, the data from which to infer the patterns uh, may have been available for independent reasons. Um, and then um, there were specialized 
statistical models and processing algorithms, some of which we will study, though not in the application to speech, that allowed systems to actually give usable speech recognition. That was in the late 1980s, early 1990s. That was for one speaker at a time. The system was speaker dependent. It was for a limited vocabulary of some hundred up to a thousand words and it required very high recording quality. Uh, a microphone, um, no ambient noise. Compare that with speech recognition today. Recording via the cell phone, speaker independent. Um, Google does not have a model for uh, that it invokes to recognize my speech and open vocabulary. I'm not limited to a thousand words, certainly, though um, the system will be better at recognizing the more frequent words and maybe bad at recognizing the less frequent ones. Um, so there's this, this gradual shift. In fact, in the 1990s, these two were maybe perceived as in competition. Um, people argued that but language is a system of rules. I think there's no denying that. Um, we use the same underlying system of rules. Otherwise, if we didn't have that, we could not communicate. I share that belief. Still, in terms of observable, practical results, um, the empiricist learning-based methods um, often were more successful. So since around 10, 15 years ago, um, I think we've come to agreement that both sides have merit, as is so often in standoff, in, in, in arguments of this type, and that they have complementary strengths and weaknesses, and that an intelligent combination of both is what is required for a good solution to the problem. So that's where we stand currently. Um, although there is a recent, very recent um, development in the type of methods used in the empiricist approach that brings some people at least back to feeling that um, maybe we actually don't need any of these rules or structures at all. So we may be headed back into some of this controversy, I feel, but not our concern. Um, so I've very abstractly introduced empiricist methods as learning inferring patterns from observable data and that is effectively the definition of what is nowadays typically called machine learning in computer science or statistical learning theory and mathematics. So that is a, a big growing subfield of computer science and mathematics. And Tom Mitchell, one of the pioneers, suggests in this quote that machine learning is the study of computer algorithms. He comes from a computer science background that improve automatically through experience. So effectively, they learn. Um, learn from examples, observable data, to make predictions about new data. Learn from pairs of speech signals and associated strings to, when given a new speech signal, predict the associated string. That's machine learning. Um, and from this, Another subfield of, well, somewhere in the intersection of computer science and mathematics has evolved, data science, data intensive sciences, other than natural language processing. For example, weather forecasting is an application of making predictions about the future from observed data in the past. Biology, physics, robotics, signal processing, others. So. Machine learning is a broad field and we will introduce you to some, to a selection of basic machine learning techniques. Um, there are many methods, I won't go through the names here, and we won't study all of them, but a selection of problems and a selection of corresponding methods that give you some breadth. But in a succession of uh, problems and methods that hang together, that build on each other to a certain degree. Okay, so that was AI, NLP, machine learning. I promised you to uh, try and interpret the various acronyms um, that we have in the course title. Um, we will be doing implementation in LISP. There is a large programming component to the class and 
again today um, we are allowing ourselves a little bit of looking back uh, paying tribute so lisp is a powerful high level language with a long tradition except for the long traditions you might say the same thing about for example python um, it has strong support for symbolic and functional programming and was discovered kind of by accident by john mccarthy in the late 1950s mccarthy heard about that guy haven't we there he is professor at stanford at the time and he actually discovered it invented it as a mathematical formalism he wanted to um, give a formal definition of computability complementary effectively to um, turing's work and the turing machine um, and one of his students steve russell um, implemented an interpreter for the formalism which effectively was a programming language so now we could program in this mathematical formalism and we still do and um, and this is another aspect of introducing this course where we used to be more apologetic than i feel we need to be today um, uh, some years ago i think um, one of the lisp pioneers said learning lisp is like learning latin many say it will make you a better citizen but that's actually i think wasn't quite true at the time and is certainly not true today um, lisp dialects of lisp are actually in active use per se think of closure a functional language that's that runs on the java virtual machine and is certainly gaining traction many large corporations develop in closure and um, and sort of more behind the scenes, uh, many of the core Lisp ideas have snuck into other programming languages. And uh, Java 8 introduced Lambda, um, anonymous functions, that comes straight from McCarthy 1958. So um, we, in a sense, introduce you to um, something that was so fundamental that it has survived the test of time and has had a tremendous impact on many of the quote modern programming languages we use today or use today in addition to Lisp obviously and um, we hope that will help you appreciate and understand those fundamentals better and as a side effect we also like using Lisp um, because it essentially levels the playing field Probably very few of you are seasoned Lisp programmers just now, so that means you more or less start in the same space, in the in the same place. And here is an example of Lisp. We'll be using the dialect known as Common Lisp. Um, there are many Scheme. Some of you have uh, learned functional programming using Scheme. That's another dialect of Lisp. It's in the same family. Common Lisp is the dialect that is fully standardized. There's an ANSI standard. Um, it's richer than Scheme. It has a multitude of built-in data types, operations. That's something we've come to come to call the standard library. Lisp has a has always had a large or Common Lisp had a large standard library from the beginning. Um, it's we believe a good teaching language. Um, because it's very easy for you to learn. It has um, a, a syntax that could not be more simple. We'll learn it today, so we'll be done with the syntax today. And it has a very straightforward semantics. So that means learning Lisp is um, a matter of a few weeks. We'll use the first two lectures exclusively to introduce you to Common Lisp, and then we'll gradually transition into using it to solve natural language processing problems. Um, time permitting, I was going to do some live programming uh, demonstration. I think we can take that time. Um, and um, So we'll make available to you a Lisp development environment and some recommendations for how to use it and the first laboratory session this 
coming week on Monday, um, we'll uh, roll that out to you. And um, now, ideally, I would have two projectors. So here is a function, a mathematical function that we'll implement in, in jointly live programming. Um, and the function is one I think you know, the factorial, defined as 1 for n equals 0, and defined as n times factorial of n minus 1 for uh, n greater than 0. So it's defined for the positive um, whole numbers including 0. It's not defined for negative numbers. Um, what's characteristic of this function? Why do I pull it up? It's not about natural language. It's recursive. I heard it. So it's recursive in the sense that the definition of the factorial function invokes the factorial function, but on a smaller instance of the problem, factorial of n minus 1. So um, what you need to know to translate that into Lisp is that you define functions by saying defun function name parameter list takes one function uh, one parameter I'm sorry um, and then we need a case distinction uh, and the distinction we make is n equals zero in which case we return one otherwise we return n minus 1. So this is the... Can you actually read this? Not quite, can you? So that's the translation of the mathematical definition into Lisp. And there's a pretty much one-to-one -one correspondence of the symbols I use here. Function definition, defun parameter n, um, name of the function, two cases for n equals zero, something, other, otherwise something else, and the something else is the recursive branch. So appreciate the simplicity of translating that into Lisp. Here I'm just typing that into the interpreter, a paradigm that you've probably experienced before. Um, interactive program development, I can just type that in um, and that means I can now use the function and what I was going to observe about the syntax is that we effectively write in what we'll call symbolic expressions and we put the operators in front of the arguments. So. It says n minus 1 on the, in the mathematical definition, but I write that as open paren minus n1. It's called prefix notation. And I always put brackets around each expression. So n minus 1, factorial of that, times n factorial of n minus 1. So there's the nesting and the correspondence of operators to operands that is always explicit. Operators always in front, in the prefix position. Each combination of an operator and all of its arguments goes into one bracketed expression. Same here. n equals zero, I write the test, and then the two operands, the two arguments. So that's effectively the syntax. Uh, fully bracketed prefix notation. Um, I have interpreted that, so now I can invoke it. And function invocation is just, um, as we effectively see in the body over there, um, a pair of parens, the name of a function, plus actual arguments. So this will compute the factorial of 5, and it um, does so um, and gives us the correct value. So that's how we can translate um, uh, simple mathematical function into an equally simple common Lisp program. And we'll um, 
continue our introduction to Common Lisp in the lecture next week and the following week. Um, yes. Um, I would certainly have a problem if I give it a negative number, you're saying, or I think you were more careful than that. You say, I think you might have a problem. <laughs> um, so what would happen with a negative number? So I'm, I, I, I observe that the function is only defined for positive numbers, including zero, and I coded it that way. So if I gave it minus three, it would go into the function and say, is minus three equals zero? No, so it would go into this branch, call itself recursively on minus three minus one, minus four, and that's not gonna be zero either, so we'll continue in that recursion working away from zero actually. We'll call ourselves recursively on smaller and smaller negative numbers, and that will never terminate. So the way I've written it here is um, will only terminate when I give it numbers that satisfy the assumption I made in the definition. If I wanted to be more cautious, I should add a test um, that first ascertains that I'm actually given a number, well, a number actually, um, and one that is zero or larger than zero. So. That will actually be a choice that we will discuss further down the road. How, to what degree should I make my code sort of double check that I'm given arguments as I expect them? Um, that will come at some additional cost. Or to what effect is it uh, valid and effective, efficient, to code according to some um, essentially algebraic understanding of um, the valid arguments for which the function is actually defined. So certainly a, a valid observation about the implementation we've given here. Equally true for the mathematical definition, we're less scared there. So we would look at this and say, huh, minus three factorial, what would we do? We might be tempted to actually try and compute it. But we understand this function well enough. We know it's defined for positive numbers, including zero. Hence, we would just say, that's undefined. All right, so that was our first peek at the development system that we'll give to you for this course. Um, it's all open source. You can obtain it and install on your own machines. We'll have some recommendations for how to do that. Connection, Lisp, and AI um, is essentially not quite accidental, but it's not as strong as people have felt at times. So Lisp was at some times dismissed um, during the AI winters, the periods when AI was not in fashion, as, well, that's just an AI language. Um, nowadays, you might say, Lisp is in an AI language, that's great. And that's a, that's a positive property currently. Um, but ultimately, it's just a programming language that has often been used to solve AI problems, but is also used to solve all sorts of other problems. Um, still, there is some connection because McCarthy coined the term, gave us the term artificial intelligence, and he also gave us the mathematical formalism that underlies the programming language Lisp. Um, in part because it's old, um, its design and existing compilers make it a fast, lean, powerful language. And um, it pioneered this paradigm of interactive development, what we just did, um, which is often um, beneficial in paradigms, approaches to programming called explorative programming, rapid prototyping, developing sort of bottom-up um, incremental interactive development. And one thing that still sets Lisp apart from everyone else is 
that it's especially suited to extend the language itself. It has facilities that allow me to define additions, even sub-languages, um, within Lisp. So, uh, we're not missionaries, really, but it's a great language. Um, as is Emacs. Um, that's a great editor. So, what we'll suggest you put to use is the combination of Emacs as an editor that is especially well suited to editing Lisp um, and the Lisp interpreter that we have pre-installed for you. How many of you have used Emacs? Well, that's at least some. Uh, we'll we hope to increase that count. Um, Emacs for starters, first-time users, has a bit of a steep learning curve, but it has a big payoff. Um, it's an unusually powerful editor. I think still today, though more almost equally powerful editors have come into existence um, in the in recent years. And Emacs is actually in no small part written in a dialect of Lisp called Emacs Lisp. And you can customize and extend Emacs um, extensively in Lisp. So it's um, it's somewhere in between an editor and an operating system or programming environment. So um, there are effectively no limits to how you can customize or extend Emacs. There are mail readers in Emacs, news readers, um, PDF browsers. That's taking it a little far for my standards. Um, I used to read my email in Emacs. Everything that has to do with editing text, um, I find it beneficial to standardize on, on one editor and learn that one editor well and have the ability to customize it, to adapt it to my preferences and needs and to extend it to add functionality to it. Um, Emacs has modes. Um, it essentially detects what kind of text you're editing. Is it a programming language? Is it email? Is it uh, something else? And it will um, adapt uh, key bindings, shortcuts to um, what you're currently trying to do. And if you are not a happy Emacs user already, we'll give you an opportunity to become one. We're we keep saying we're not missionaries. I think we'll continue to say that. But there is a bit of a missionary in us. Um, so we would really appeal to all of you to uh, at least give it a shot. I mean, ultimately, you can, of course, use other editors. Um, we don't grade submissions to problem uh, programming projects by which editor you used. But we will actually look at how you indent and what you name things and where you place parentheses. So the look and feel of your submissions. And Emacs will, it, will make it especially easy to uh, arrive at a look and feel of your programs, your Lisp programs, that is readable. So uh, we have some recommendations for next, week, ne next week's laboratory for how to get started in Emacs. Um, now we're approaching the end of today's overview. Um, this is essentially a rough breakdown of the topics we'll cover throughout the semester. We need to learn a little bit of Lisp. Um, then we'll start on machine learning techniques, um, initially non-probabilistic techniques, um, so-called vector space models or geometric models, um, which we will use to classify and cluster, that is to set labels onto things that are related or to form groups of things that are related. And from there, we'll then introduce basic notions of probability theory um, and move from these geometric models to um, probabilistic models. Um, already the vector space models essentially take advantage of statistical regularities but they don't formalize them in terms of probabilities. We'll do that next. Then we'll move to uh, sequence models and sequence classification models, so-called hidden Markov models, uh, 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 variant 
uh, or a, a modeling framework, a technique that is used um, everywhere. So in error correction, in, in the GSM cell phone communication protocol, you find hidden Markov models. So a uh, prime example of a technique that we introduce in the application to natural language processing problems, but that has many other applications. And finally, we'll wrap up by uh, looking into a machine learning problem that is typically labeled, classified as structured prediction, so beyond just sequences. And there we will look at the sushi with tuna or chopsticks example, that is syntactic uh, structure of natural language and recognizing the structure of a language according to some assumption about its grammar is parsing as we have in compiler construction. And again, because there is ambiguity, there's a search problem, we will look into statistical parsing techniques. So recurring themes in all of these is machine learning. Um, we will often give you assignments that invoke non-trivial data sets, training data and test data. Often data sets that are actually commonly used in current research. So we're um, we, we believe it's actually valuable, it's important that you try and solve these problems in a manner that scales to realistic data set sizes. Not just toy examples, but um, for example, millions of words in, in training data. Um, and that will, in some cases, actually connect us almost to the state of the art in, in, in the corresponding NLP research literature. Search, obviously, disambiguation problems, and applications of dynamic programming to that search. So uh, we'll meet every week for two hours, and then that will be complemented by laboratory sessions. Um, here is a final attempt at a very high-level summary of uh, some of the topics I... Does that actually work? Yes, it does. So there is statistical learning theory in application to search problems that involve natural language ambiguity. We care about implementation, specifically about implementation that uses data structures and procedures that scale to large data volumes. Um, and the intersection of all of these is what we put into this class. Um, right, here's an attempt to put that into one sentence. Efficient and scalable algorithms and data structures both go hand in hand for searching probabilistically weighted solution spaces. Um, at the end of the term, we might come back to this and ask, okay, how did we deliver the various pieces? And I hope you will agree that we do. We certainly intend to. Okay more, much more down to earth. Um, there will be a written exam at the end of the term and to qualify for the exam you need to succeed in solving obligatory exercises. There is programming, that's a, a large part of the course, and the best part to learn to program is to actually do it and we help you do it regularly by giving you the opportunity to submit your programs, your solutions, frequently. And there will be three obligatory exercises, but we break the second and the third into two parts so that there are in total five submissions. And there's a system of awarding points, a maximum of 10 for each part, and minimum requirements to pass. So it's not just pass-fail, but for each thing you submit, we... Um, graded and award you between zero and ten points. Sometimes there may even be bonus points available. And to qualify for the exam, you need a minimum of six points against the first exercise and a minimum of 12 from the sum of 2a and 2b and again a minimum of 12 from the sum of 3a and 3b. These will often build on each other and hence we need to enforce a rigid, a fixed schedule. So we cannot accept late submissions. The deadlines are what they are. And 
we cannot allow resubmission. So you get five, you get three points on two A. Um, there's nothing you will be able to do about two A, but there's still something you can do to qualify for the exam, and that is to work harder on two B. So our scheme to sort of enforce this regular schedule is to allow you to make up for missing points on one part of the assignment by bringing in more points from the second part. When there is illness, of course, we will need to accommodate that. But that may in the extreme mean that we actually give you a fresh assignment because when the deadlines have passed, we will publish a model solution and that model solution will often be the starting point for the next part. So these build on each other and we want you at each point to have available what we think is a good solution. Once we have published that, it's obvious we can no longer accept late submissions or resubmissions. We have yet to decide on the exact schedule, but we will post that no later than next week so that you know the dates when our assignments are published and the submission deadlines by when we expect them uh, to come back. Um, I'll skip over this, but there will be occasional quizzes where you can get some um, bonus points. Um, I'll also not comment in detail on our reading list, but there are pieces of these three books, um, two of them are available online and um, in fact there's a forthcoming third edition of this one where select chapters are also available online and coming down, Mohav and I said we actually need to look into how suitable those drafts are um, for the pieces that we need. Um, I think it's worth your obtaining a copy of this book, Jurafsky and Martin. The others, um, it's up to you. They are good books. We recommend them wholeheartedly, but they are available online. So if you buy them, that is to actually have your own paper copy. Um, here are some additional recommendations, um, also linked from the course page already. So finally, in terms of communication, we want to interact with you, but with 90 or so students, um, we need to make that efficient for you and for us. So we've set up a, a Piazza forum. I assume most of you, many of you have used Piazza before. It's an online discussion board where we encourage you to post questions. We encourage you to post answers to other, other people's questions. The slides will be posted on the, on the course page. Um, I see someone is either live casting on Facebook or taking pictures of the slides. Both, I think, should not be necessary. Um, we'll put the slides on the course page uh, after the lecture and there will be a screencast and that usually becomes available the next day. That needs to be processed in Trondheim. So Piazza, our primary means of communication. You can talk to each other, you can answer other people's questions. We will be following the discussion on Piazza. Um, we will try to be helpful. Um, truth be told, it often encourages us to also answer questions when others have tried to answer already. So make that a culture of interacting with each other and us on Piazza online outside of class hours. There's an email list in 4820 Help that reaches all of us. Mohav, myself, Elena Volkova is the laboratory assistant. And when you send us email, use this mailing alias rather than contact us directly. Um, when email is generated, that's not going to be very often. Um, it goes to your UIO email, so make sure you actually read that, redirect it to wherever you receive email. And it's possible to subscribe to the course page through RSS um, so that you get updates. And um, a lot of the information will come on the online discussion board and on the news stream. Let me just bring that up. So here we, we've started the news stream, the, the messages on the course page. That's where we will typically make announcements that we don't make in, in class. Any questions? 
When is the exam? Um, I have no idea. In December. Um, that will be published here, but... Um, oh, it is actually. So on, on December 2. Yes? Format of the lab sessions. Um, so Elena and at least in the beginning of the semester, Murhaf in a second room. So there are two rooms with lab sessions. And we'll often have some introductory review of things, demonstration of things, uh, discussion of a model solution. So there will often be a, an initial plenary block, sort of informal lecturing. And then a large part of the lab session will be devoted to work with the current assignment. At any point in time, there will be a current assignment. And on those, you work individually. So we don't expect group submissions, but we expect individual submissions to our assignments, the obligatory exercises. I think we're out of time for today. See you next week. Um, and maybe before then on Piazza.